Now, back to that set of curls with 100 pounds for 10 reps to failure, so you might gain a better understanding of intensity. Let's look at the nature of it. Let's start in the beginning with the first rep. Of all the reps of the set, the first rep obviously would be the easiest, requiring the least intensity of effort. Or, referring to the definition of intensity that you've written down, one would say that the first rep requires the least percentage of his possible momentary muscular effort of all the reps of the set. Allow me to explain this point a little further, then we'll move more briskly straight ahead, I promise. If you were to look outside right now and happen to see a loved one pinned under the front wheel of a car, we've all heard stories like this, you would dart out there as quickly as you possibly could, and in the attempt to remove the automobile, you would exert yourself with 100% of your possible momentary muscular effort. Or to make it more simple from here on, let's just plug in the word for the definition. You would exert yourself with 100% intensity of effort. Now, the first rep of that set of curls would not require anywhere near 100% intensity of effort. Again, it would be the easiest rep of the set. That first rep does fatigue you somewhat, however, and that is why the second rep is at least a little bit harder to complete, whereas the first rep may require on the order of 8 to 10% intensity of effort. The second rep, you see, may require closer to 15 to 20% intensity of effort. The second rep fatigues you even further still, and that's why the third is even harder to complete than was the second. And without belaboring the issue, you know that's how it goes with each successive rep of the set. Each becomes progressively harder to complete. Each requires more intensity of effort than did the preceding, until finally we get to the last rep in this case, the tenth rep to failure, that would be the only rep which is said to require 100% intensity of effort, just like trying to lift the automobile. Now the important question. Which rep listener would be more productive in terms of stimulating a strength and size increase? The first rep, which is the least intense, or the last rep, which is the most intense? The only rep requiring 100% intensity of effort. Yes, of course, the last. If you could curl 100 pounds for a maximum of 10 reps, and for some weird reason you only ever just did the first, and then put the bar right back down at that point, you would never grow. Why? Because the intensity of the stress at that point is not sufficiently threatening to the physiology to warrant an adaptive response, i.e., a strength in muscle mass increase. Just like you can obtain a suntan sitting in front of a 100-watt light bulb, even if you sit there for an infinity of eternities, the stress is not high enough. Do you see where it stands to reason that if the last rep is more productive than the first rep, it is also better than the second, third, fourth, fifth, and so on? Yes, in fact, that last rep is quite special. It is different from every other rep of the set. There is something that occurs physiologically only on that last rep of a set carried to failure, which is literally responsible for flipping on the growth machinery inside the muscle. How is that last rep different? What occurs physiologically at that point, which makes the last rep so special? Well, no one understands all of the biochemical or physiologic changes entirely. Some of the changes or differences are readily apparent, however. For instance, Compare your breathing on the first rep of the set compared to the last. On the first rep, your breathing is not labored at all. Your heart is beating normally, and you experience no distress. By the last rep, you are breathing like a racehorse. Your heart is pounding like a trip hammer, and you feel quite different. You feel stressed, perhaps even lightheaded or nauseous. Obviously, there is something different that is going on physiologically on that last rep, which makes it rather different. And now the important conclusion. Having achieved your purpose of triggering the growth mechanism into motion by going to failure on that one set, you don't have to do it again. You don't need a second set. It's like when you throw the switch to turn on a light. Once the light is on, you are confident that the electrical mechanism will remain in motion. There is no need to flip the switch up and down repeatedly. You just wear it out. There is much about the human being which is mechanistic. 
I am not speaking metaphorically when I refer to the growth mechanism. There is a physiologic growth mechanism, and your purpose, once again, is to do what nature requires to trigger that into motion by carrying one set to a point of momentary muscular failure. And having achieved that by going to failure on one set, it is neither necessary nor desirable to do another set. A note here with regard to the detractors of high-intensity training theory. When someone denies the validity of the theory, they are, in effect, denying the validity of the principle of intensity, which, recall, is the intellectual foundation of exercise science. In denying the principle of intensity, they are saying that the level of effort is not important, plays no role in stimulating growth, which is tantamount to saying that the first rep of a set carried to failure at 10 reps is just as likely to stimulate growth as the last. Anyone with a modicum of training experience, or a little common sense, knows that such is ludicrous, as of course the last rep, the most intense, the one requiring 100% intensity of effort is the most productive rep. Quite often I'm asked if performing a second set would really make that much difference. And the answer is, not only would it make a difference, but going from one set to two is the biggest mistake of all. For it is the biggest increase possible. A 100% increase. Going from one set to two sets represents a 100% increase in the volume of the exercise, making for twice the inroad into recovery ability. And that's how it should be properly viewed. Often when taking a new client through a workout. He'll note the fact that I have him performing but one set per exercise, whereupon he'll ask, but Mike, you only had me doing one set. I feel like I should do another set. And I respond to the effect that the feeling he has is fear, specifically a fear that he hasn't performed enough exercise to stimulate growth. And that if he could provide me with one good reason, not two, just one good reason why I should consider allowing him to do one more set I would consider it. And after all these years as a trainer, not one single individual has ever given me one good reason. And that is the issue, listener, precisely how many sets one should perform. If you honestly believe that one set is not enough, it is incumbent upon you to tell me precisely how many sets are required. Which brings me to the second fundamental of bodybuilding science, the issue pertaining to volume. Many years ago, Arthur Jones made a statement that struck me as remarkably intelligent and very important. He said, and I quote, Mike, the issue of volume, or number of sets, is a negative factor or influence, period, insofar that one trains at all, whether he does one set or a hundred sets, volume is a negative thing here. And that is because any exercise makes an inroad into the body's limited reserve of biochemical resources known as recovery ability, close quote. To help you understand the concept inroad, you might visualize an in into the road or a hole being dug into your body's limited reserve of resources. You perform one set and you dig a small hole, a second set a deeper hole, a third set an even deeper hole, and so on. This is a negative thing here, for the deeper the hole gets, the greater the inroad into the body's limited reserve of resources, the more of your body's resources then have to be used in the attempt to fill the hole, which is recovery, leaving that much less left over or available for building the mountain on top, the muscle. Ideally, one would stimulate growth with zero sets, then none of the body's resources would be wasted on recovery, with all of it being used for growth production, and one would grow so damn fast it would stagger the imagination. However, at this point in time, I haven't figured out how to stimulate growth with zero sets. Just joking, of course. Overtraining, by definition, means carrying on any more exercise than the precise amount required to stimulate growth. Most, however, seem to regard overtraining as something only kind of negative. Overtraining is much worse than that. It is precisely that which militates against muscle growth production. Don't make the mistake of thinking that overtraining is merely wasted effort. No, it is counterproductive. Again, it is exactly that which prevents you from growing. When you are finished working out, you don't feel the same as you did before the workout, do you? No, you're exhausted. And by exhausted, I don't mean merely in the personal sense that you feel very tired or fatigued, but also in the technical sense that you've exhausted 
or used up a considerable portion of your body's limited reserve of resources merely to fuel the workout. You actually feel like you're in a hole. You're tired. The first thing the body must do following a workout is not grow, but recover, overcome the inroad. That is, fill that hole. Or as I like to say more precisely, compensate for the exhaustive effects of the workout. Or more simply, replenish, restore, put back what was used up, put back what was there before the workout. The body must first replace what was there before the workout, or compensate, before it can put back more than was there before the workout, or overcompensate, which of course is what growth is. Recovery is putting back what was there before, i.e. compensating, and growth is putting back more than was there before, i.e. overcompensating. Recovery, therefore, precedes growth. And if you train again before the body has completed both the recovery and the growth processes, growth production will be compromised, short-circuited, shy of 100 possible units. Important here is the fact that the process of recovery alone may take up to several days or longer to be completed before the body even has the opportunity to start producing the growth that the workout merely stimulated. Please note the distinction between growth stimulation and growth production. And if the trainee works out again before the recovery process is completed, he will short circuit the growth production process and merely start digging another hole. When I first started training people some years ago, I had my clients train three days a week, every 48 hours, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, with weekends off. And while most of them did well, I was absolutely convinced that they weren't achieving the results I knew were possible. And I didn't attribute this to undertraining, but to overtraining. So as remedy, I reduced their training frequency to one workout every 72 hours. Now they were training on Monday, taking Tuesday and Wednesday off, then training Thursday, taking Friday and Saturday off, and training Sunday and so forth. While their progress was better, it still wasn't as good as I knew to be possible. Some might be prompted to ask the question at this point, well, Metzer, what motivated you to continue thinking in this direction? It was something I learned from philosophy, that when in possession of a truly valid theory, and beyond that, and just as important, you're making the proper practical application of the theoretical principles, progress will be little short of spectacular all the time. No matter what the field of endeavor, whether you're sending a man to the moon, performing surgery, or developing muscle mass beyond normal levels. I had to admit that my client's progress wasn't always thus. It wasn't until I reduced their training frequency to once every four to seven days, back in February of 1995, that voila, they finally started achieving results of the order I always knew were possible. Where prior to that, I would only occasionally have a client gain 10 to 20 pounds in a month, or 30 to 40 pounds in three to five months, since February of 1995, such results have been the rule. I was initially reluctant to go to once every four to seven days, as I, like everyone else apparently, had blindly and uncritically accepted the notion that decompensation starts after 96 hours of no training. This was during a period of rigorous philosophic retraining on my part when I had reached the conviction I would never ever again blindly accept anything that mystical they had to say. They say, who is this they we all keep hearing about? I recall that many times I and numerous other bodybuilders of experience would remark, have you ever noticed that when you take a week or two layoff that you always come back stronger? And every single one, without exception, replied, you know, now that you mention it, yes, I have noticed that after a week or two off, I always come back stronger. I finally realized that if one comes back stronger after a week or two layoff, then he didn't decompensate. That is, grow weaker and smaller. No, he in fact overcompensated, just the opposite. He got stronger and didn't lose anything. Well, if you don't atrophy or decompensate after up to two weeks of no training, how in the hell is it going to happen after four days? It won't. And remember, it may take up to several days or longer just to compensate or recover from the workout. There is no decompensation 
after four to seven days. No way, it just doesn't happen. I want to wrap up this section on theory with a broad general statement on which I'll then elaborate briefly before describing the actual workout program. It is this, and I'd like you to write it down, please, very important. The big picture, the big picture in bodybuilding is comprised essentially of two elements of equal value, 50-50. Not 60-40 or 70-30, but 50-50. The first element, 50% of the big picture, of course, is the workout itself. And the other element, just as important as the workout, the other 50% is the rest period between workouts. And this is why that is true. The workout, you understand, does not actually produce muscle growth. Remember, the workout merely serves to stimulate or trigger the body's growth mechanism into motion. It is the body itself, of course, which actually produces the growth, but only if left undisturbed during a sufficient rest period. You don't rest enough, you don't grow enough. Now, if you accept my premise that the rest period between workouts is that important, do you see where it follows logically that there has to be a perfect or optimum number of days of rest, and anything less than that will compromise progress? And I have found that for most, one workout every four to seven days, as I said before, is literally almost miraculous compared to any other frequency protocol. Okay, that's enough with training theory. I'd like to start this section on the actual training routine with a prefatory point. Only if there was a God would he have the luxury of being able to read your genetic material, your DNA, and say to you with absolute certainty, Sir, thou shalt perform four sets per workout, once every 101 hours, any more, any less will compromise your progress. The point here, of course, is that I don't even have the luxury of being able to work with you in person, let alone read your DNA. Therefore, I can't guarantee anyone I'd start him out on the same baseline program the Almighty would. But then I ain't so sure it'd be all that different either, as at least we'd both be clear about the fundamental principles. I am going to suggest that everyone start with what I have determined through vast personal experience as a trainer, works quite well for most. And if after finishing three cycles of the four workout program, your strength hasn't increased significantly, that you switch to the consolidation program as described in the booklet that came along with these tapes. You might want to take notes on my description of the baseline program, although it too is contained in the booklet. I want to go over this one verbally, however, as there are numerous important points and details which I believe you'll better understand if I explain them on tape. Some of the points relate to safety, and as a personal trainer, of course, safety is always of paramount concern. You will start by training once every four days on a four-workout protocol. So, if you start on a Monday, that means you wouldn't train again till Friday. After Friday, you wouldn't train again till Tuesday, then Saturday, and so forth once every four days. And if a scheduling problem arises so that you can't make it into the gym on day four, take off one more day and train on day five. Also, once you've been with the program for three weeks or so, start inserting an additional rest day or two, even at random. If you do, you should never hit a sticking point, and here's why. As you grow stronger week to week, as you will with this program, that is, as you lift progressively heavier weights, the stresses on the body grow progressively greater too. Until finally, unless you do certain things like add extra rest days, the stresses will reach a critical point, they'll constitute overtraining, and the first symptom will be a slowdown in progress. And if you continue with exactly the same volume and frequency protocol, there will ultimately be a complete cessation of progress. Continue inserting the additional rest days with greater and greater regularity until you are only training once every five days, then start inserting an extra rest day at random, a sixth day. Continue inserting the extra rest day or days with greater regularity until you're eventually training once every six to seven days. Once the fundamentals of intensity, volume, and frequency are grasped, this issue becomes the most crucial one of bodybuilding science. That, as the weights grow progressively greater, the stresses also grow progressively greater, and they must be compensated for. 
If after a number of months, utilizing the baseline program while training once every six to seven days ceases to yield meaningful results, switch to the consolidation program. Some may want to have the workout program with the additional points in their training journal to take to the gym. If so, write down the words day one, close to the upper left-hand corner of your paper, and then write the word chest. Next to it, the number one. Exercise number one for the pecs will be pec deck for six to ten reps to failure. Now from here on, you won't have to write the words to failure, as that is a given, and six to ten reps is merely a suggested guideline. There is nothing magic about the number ten. If you reach ten, but you see you might go to thirteen reps to failure, don't stop at ten, go to thirteen. And at the other end, if you see by rep three, you won't reach even six reps, but only four or five, don't stop and reload. Get four or five. The next time you'll likely get six to ten. And if you don't have access to a pec deck, then flat bench dumbbell flies or cable crosses may be substituted. Directly underneath exercise one, write out the word superset. And directly underneath that, the number two. Exercise number two for the pecs will be the incline press, preferably on a machine such as the Smith, hammer, I carry in or Nautilus. If you don't have any machine for the incline press, you may perform either regular free weight barbell incline presses or incline dumbbell presses. Exercise number two should be performed for one to three reps, not six to ten, one to three reps. And make a parenthetic note next to the incline press. Use a fairly close hand grip. Your hand should be slightly closer than shoulder width. What should be wide are not your hands, but your elbows. Flare your elbows way back away from your torso toward your ears. And you'll feel all the stress go into the pecs. Contrary to popular opinion, a wide grip is not the best way to develop pecs. And for beginners, a superset means two sets, one set of each of two different exercises, where the performance of one is followed immediately by the other. As with pec decks supersetted, or followed immediately by incline press. All right, now write down the word back, still under day one, write down the word back, and then the number one itself. Exercise number one for the back will be close grip, palms up, pull downs, six to 10 repetitions. Close grip, palms up, pull downs. Directly underneath that, write down the number two, which will be regular style, not stiff-legged, but regular deadlifts. There is no superset here, by the way. There will be no superset unless I specify. And where there is no superset, you may rest as long as necessary, but no longer. Don't overcomplicate this issue. Use your common sense. Let your breathing slow down. And as soon as you feel ready to resume training, do so. Do not allow the workout to degenerate into a race against the clock. And don't malinger either. The regular style deadlift is a very productive exercise the most productive exercise of all, in fact, because it stimulates so much muscle mass, everything on the backside of the body from the Achilles tendon to the nape of the neck. However, there is a bit of a risk factor here, not seen with most other exercises, so listen carefully. If you have one available and you are strong enough, use an Olympic bar with a 45-pound plate on each end of the bar so you don't have to bend over quite so far. Always start with the bar rolled back flush against your shins, grasp the bar with a slightly wider than shoulder width grip, and use an interlocking hand grip where one hand is overhand, the other hand is underhand. Squat down in such a fashion that your hips are at least slightly lower than your shoulders. And most important of all, keep your back perfectly flat and your head up. Keep your back perfectly flat and your head up. You might even pick out a point on the wall, that crevice where the wall meets the ceiling, and keep your attention trained on that unwaveringly throughout. Then stand up in a deadlift fashion with considerable rotation around the hips until you're standing perfectly straight, no need to arch backwards. Then put the bar back down, reset, and do another. Perform five to eight reps as close to failure as you're willing to go. If you have problems with your lower back, shrugs may be substituted and do 6 to 10 reps to failure.
That's all on day one. Just four total sets. Then 96 hours or four days later is day two. Write down the words day two. On day two, you will train legs. The first exercise is leg extensions. Superseted with exercise number two, leg press. Now, just to the right of the words leg extension and leg press, using a common bracket or a parenthesis, indicate that each is to be performed for 8 to 15 reps. If you don't have a leg press, substitute squats, preferably in a Smith machine. You're not going to be doing leg curls for a while. Just because an exercise is done traditionally for a certain muscle, doesn't mean, of course, that you are morally or legally bound to do it all year round. One of the first lessons I learned as a trainer years ago is that the leg biceps and the biceps of the upper arm overtrain extremely easily. Besides, the hamstrings will receive sufficient stimulation for now from the deadlift and the leg press and the squat. I would like to make a very important point here. This program is designed for the exclusive purpose of marshalling all of your body's energy and resources onto the side of maximum growth in your major muscle groups. Any exercise you might add beyond what is listed here will merely subtract from maximum growth in the major muscle groups. Very often, when I give this program to a fellow client, he will say at the end, well, Mr. Mincer, I see you don't have me doing leg curls for the hamstrings, in fact. No seated calf raise for the inner calf. No bent over dumbbell concentration curls for the lower outer third of the biceps. And we're not doing this for that and that for this and on and on ad infinitum. And I respond, sir, but that is precisely how you were training before. And that is why you made no progress and were prompted to call me for counseling. You so burned yourself out with all those exercises. You dug so deep of a hole. Your body never had the opportunity to recover from the merely exhaustive effects of the exercise, let alone grow. Why not build a 20-inch arm first, then worry about the details? Remember, the issue of volume in anaerobic exercise is a negative factor, as I stated earlier, and that your purpose is not to see how many sets you can do or how long you can endure. Your purpose is to do the precise amount of exercise required to stimulate growth, then get out of the gym, go home, rest, and grow. After the leg extension, leg press, superset, take a rest, Go drink some water, walk around the gym for a minute or two, then finish up quite simply with a set of standing calf raises 12 to 20 reps. And that is it for day two. 96 hours, or four days after legs, is day three. On day three, you'll train delts and arms. Write down the word delts. For delts, you start out with dumbbell laterals. Some people call them side raises, six to 10 reps. After a brief rest, but no superset here, Proceed to exercise number two for delts, either bend over dumbbell laterals, or if one is available, sit in a pec deck backwards and work your rear delts six to ten reps here too. After delts, you'll work your arms. You might write down the word arms. Exercise number one for arms is barbell curls, six to ten. Six to ten reps with barbell curls. And that is a straight bar, not an easy curl bar. Easy curls do not work the biceps. They work the brachialis on the outer part of the arm. Do straight bar barbell curls. Exercise number two for the arms is tricep press downs with either a straight bar or a V-bar, but do not use a rope. Do not use a rope, either a straight bar or a V-bar. Six to ten reps for the tricep press down. And if a press down machine is not available, perform one set of lying French presses for six to ten reps. Immediately after the press down, in superset fashion, proceed to dips between parallel bars for three to five reps to failure. Three to five. If you can do more than five reps with your body weight, then add weight. And if you can't do any positive or full range dips, then place a chair or bench between the dip bars, stand up into the straight arm locked elbow position, and lower yourself in negative fashion taking several seconds to reach the bottom, then stand up on the chair into the straight arm position and do it again. When you can perform up to 10 negative dips, with each rep taking several seconds to complete, 
you should be able to do regular full range dips. Okay. 96 hours later is day four. Legs. Yes, legs again. This time you will start with leg extensions and follow immediately in superset fashion with Smith machine or free weight squats, but don't do hack squats unless absolutely forced to do so. Hack squats are not very productive and they stress the knees inordinately. You will perform the leg extensions differently this time using approximately 30 pounds more than the last time when you perform the leg extension with the leg press. You will do but one positive rep, lifting the lower legs until they are in the straight leg lock knee position. You will hold that position statically. This is called a static hold rep. The weight will be sufficiently heavy so that you're limited to holding the straight leg lock knee position for approximately 10 to 25 seconds. There will come a point during that period, of course, when you won't be able to hold it anymore, and you'll say to yourself, if I don't start to lower this thing in the next moment or two, it's going to go crashing down. Do not let that happen. When you recognize it's necessary, lower the legs slowly in controlled negative fashion, not hyper slow or imperceptibly slow, but under strict control all the way down to the bottom. And make sure that you keep your buttocks planted firmly in the seat, as there is a tendency to want to come up off the seat when your thighs are burning and torque it down. Do not torque it down. Lower with the strength of the thigh muscles alone. Then proceed immediately to the squat and perform 8 to 15 reps to failure. Take a rest for a couple minutes. Go get some water. And finish once again with a set of standing calf raises 12 to 20. And then four days later, you start over with day one and repeat the four workout protocol as already described. Whenever I have a superset listed, as with pec deck and incline press, or leg extension leg press, or leg extension squat, start the warm up on the second exercise. For instance, when performing the leg extension squat superset, if you start with the leg extensions without having first warmed up the glutes, spinal erectors and so forth, by doing a couple of sets of squats first off, as you finish the leg extension and you're heading to the squat, you'll say to yourself, but my goodness, I forgot to warm up for the squat. Same thing with the incline press and the leg press. By warming up on the second exercise first, you cover all your bases in terms of a warm up. And you'll also have the weight set on that exercise so that you may perform a true superset where one exercise is followed immediately by another with no rest in between. And please, don't change the sequence of exercises I've listed. Everything I've given you here was for a good reason. Which is not to say that you can't periodically change exercises, although I would be hesitant, as the exercises listed are all the best ones for the muscles involved. And don't make the mistake of gauging or evaluating the success of any one of these workouts by the standard of feeling, whether or not you get sore or achieve a pump. I see certain people who have been training at Gold's Gym in Venice, California for hours every day for years. If achieving a pump was a surefire indication that growth was stimulated, these people would have 28-inch arms by now as they get pumped every time they work out. The pump, of course, is only temporary and does not indicate that growth was stimulated. And if getting sore was necessary, I never would have won a physique title as I almost literally never got sore usually only after a layoff. You can only evaluate the success of any one of these workouts by whether or not you're stronger the next time you perform that workout. So keep a training journal as described in the value added booklet. I would suggest that if you have been training recently without a layoff prior to the time you intend to start this program, take a break entirely from training for two to three weeks. Having been overtrained, you've made a deep, too deep, an inroad into your body's recovery ability. It is important that this inroad be overcome so that when you start with a properly conducted high intensity routine, your body will have recovered all the biochemical resources necessary for optimal growth production.